one thing uh, we need to do is we need to have at least two windows open inside of Jasper. Go to Jasper and then go to the workshop cluster. You need to SSH to it. And you need to copy minus R, which is recursive. And then from the central location to your home directory, which or your current directory, which is the doc, what it means. Uh, and then you need to go into this new directory that you've just uh, created by copying uh, the other one. You can also find a copy of the slides and materials, both on the link that you guys were all sent uh, earlier, as well as following this link here. Um, has everybody been able to uh, get into the test cluster? Has anybody not? If you have not, please go to the group chat and uh, ask for help or speak now. Um, also, uh, if you do talk to uh, on the group chat, uh, you need to identify yourself. And then somebody will help the people in the group chat, which uh, are still having issues. I'm going to begin with the talk. Um, unless there's very many uh, people which aren't. And if you are having an issue, please. Uh... Okay, good. So this is uh, part one, scheduling and job management, how to use uh, cluster effectively. So we'll start with, you know, scheduling theory, uh, how scheduling works. We'll try submitting a few jobs, and we'll run a, a few jobs uh, of the parallel types so of parallel computing and job submission. So back scheduling. Uh, it's typically not used uh, when you need a service, for example, a web server that runs all the time. So this isn't really the cloud type usage. Um, but it is preferred when you have one or more jobs or simulations that need to run and you wish to get the results back sometime in the future. Um, so you have some discrete problem you need to solve, some compute uh, run that you need to run. Uh, this is where you would use batch scheduling. So your job is automatically started by the scheduler when there's enough resources are available and you get the resource back uh, and you may be notified when your job starts and finishes. So let's start with a typical uh, HPC cluster. Um, so here is a drawing of a typical high performance computing cluster. There's usually a very fast FinnBand network. There is uh, connections going from the internet, what's it called, into your login nodes. There's usually an administrative node or a scheduling node and a whole bunch of compute nodes. Sorry? Was there a question? Okay. If not, I'll continue. So this is typically how a cluster looks like. This is the, the type of machine that you would be logging in to run your code. So what are the goals of scheduling? Well. There's three goals, basically. So scheduling needs to be efficient, sorry, it needs to be fair and policy. So uh, there could be some policy, this cluster is dedicated to certain users, certain groups, and all the jobs have to be fairly allocated between them. So as there's, uh, you're, you're submitting jobs, other people are submitting jobs, you want some fairness uh, and adherence to the policy, the goal of the machine. We also want uh, efficiency, utilization, and throughput. So we basically want to keep using all the resources in the cluster. Uh, you don't want the cluster sitting empty. And we need to also minimize the turnaround time. So you want to get your answers back from your uh, simulations as fast as possible. Unfortunately, those three goals conflict. You can optimize on one, but by necessarily, uh, it will conflict with the other goals. Uh, 
the goal of uh, a scheduler is to try to balance between these three goals and to do so uh, as effectively as possible. So fairness in policy. Uh, fairness does not, does not necessarily mean that everyone or every group, group gets the same usage. Uh, an important science project may get a larger allocation. And the scheduler fairly allocates, a scheduler is supposed to fairly allocate according to usage policy. So for efficiency, utilization, and throughput, well, we want all the resources, the CPUs, the GPUs, the memory, the disk, the software licenses, bandwidth, and many more. We all want them to be used as much as possible. Now, obviously, with jobs being of different sizes, it's going to be impossible to use all the resources all the time. So there's going to be gaps in there between scheduling these different types of resources. And of course, minimize the turnaround time. So the goal is to get the return uh, answer to you as fast as possible. Now, this is really important for users that use an iterative process. So if you need to ask a question, have run a simulation, get the results back, and then based upon those results, move forward and run another simulation, uh, the fact that theoretically you could get a lot of compute time done, but if turnaround takes a month, it will uh, you know, be, not, be not effective to you you want to iterate as fast as possible, get results as fast as possible. So a few insights. Well, before that, so all these goals, they're contradictory a little bit. Um, the, to, ma to maximize efficiency, uh, we would do that by getting everybody's, uh, what's it called, uh, job submissions and get as many as possible, wait as long, t long time, and then figure out how to most efficiently pack the jobs. Unfortunately, that conflicts with uh, minimizing your turnaround time. So it's all a balance between these. Uh, so an important insight is that the shorter the wall time, the less long your, each of your jobs run uh, before being killed or shut down, the better we can meet all three goals. So the finer we could schedule, the shorter each of these jobs are, the more efficient we could make the cluster, the more, uh, the less turnaround time it will take to run a job, and the more fair we could make it according to the policy. So jobs that use a large amount of resources per job, well, they result in a reduction of fairness, efficiency, and re responsiveness of the scheduling system. So if somebody wants to run a job that takes a whole cluster, well, it's very difficult to be as fair as if it was a small job. Uh, same with efficiency and uh, turnaround time. A big job will prevent, a job that uses the whole cluster will prevent your job from running, right? So it's all a trade-off. And at the same time, larger jobs are, you know, where the large science is, right? So. We want to support both. So here's an advantage of a large cluster. The larger clusters are more fair, efficient, and responsive just by being larger. Because proportionately, a job that can take the whole cluster, or a small cluster, will only take you know, a certain percentage on a larger cluster. And a larger cluster can more efficiently uh, run the same jobs. So larger clusters are capable of running large jobs, expanding capability as well. So they could la run much larger job. You could run, you know, on a 4,000 node cluster, you could run on 4,000 nodes. But if you're running even larger jobs, then we lose the advantage of a large cluster. Shared resources such as West Grid are better, and they're used more efficiently than multiple small clusters. So the, the larger the scope of the shared resources, the better. Basically, what that means is if you have a group cluster or a departmental cluster, they're not going to be used as efficiently as, you know, a cluster that's <laughs> utilizing 
that, that that's shared across Canada. So this is why uh, using shared resources. Looks like we may have lost Camille momentarily here. We'll just hold for a moment and I'm sure I'll be dialing back in. Hi, Camille, can you hear us? Yeah, Camille, you're just breaking up on us a bit here. And you're back live now? Yes. So we can see, we can see you and hear you fine. OK. So everybody here at the U of A lost connectivity. I'm not sure whether uh, other people did. Uh, I know Masao, which is TA in this, uh, lost connectivity. Calgary, too. Oh, Calgary also lost connectivity. So maybe we'll wait a moment to make sure everybody has access. Just to remind you, you'll have to reshare your content, Camille. Okay. <coughs> there we go. The content's looking. Content's looking good for me, Camille. I hope everybody else can see it okay. Okay, I think we did lose a few people. Uh, I think. Uh, when did you guys hear me last? That's tough to say. It's pretty dense material. <laughs> you want to back up just a few minutes. I'm guessing after minimize turnaround time? Sure, start there. Actually, yeah, that's familiar. That's familiar. Um, so, some insights. Uh, the shorter the wall time, which is the maximum time a job can run before being killed or before you know, stopping, uh, the better we can meet the three goals of scheduling. So if the jobs take half an hour in time, of course, it's much easier to be more responsive. Um, if jobs take a few days or a month to run, then the cluster will not be available to other users, right? And this goes for all the goals. So for fairness, efficiency, and responsiveness. At the same time, if we want to run enormous jobs, so there's you know, gigantic uh, computers, the top 10 computers in the world, for instance, uh, they run enormous jobs using the whole computer, the whole cluster, sorry. Uh, those type of cluster jobs, uh, or any large jobs, result in a reduction of fairness, efficiency, and responsiveness of the scheduling system. So the larger the job, the more difficult it is to deal with it, and the less efficiency, efficiently the scheduling system can deal with it and run it, uh, the less responsiveness that it will have to other users. So the more nodes we have, the better we can meet these goals. So these are the advantages of a large cluster. Large clusters are more fair, efficient, just by being larger. Larger clusters are capable of running larger jobs, expanding capabilities 
capability. But if the larger jobs are run exclusively, we lose the advantage of a larger cluster. So larger clusters either are more eff fair, efficient, and responsive, or they just allow larger jobs to be run, or maybe some combination of both. Uh, shared resources such as WestGrid are better and are used more efficiently than multiple smaller clusters. The larger the scope of the shared resources, the better. So it, there's big advantages for uh, running on shared resources. So let's visualize a single node cluster. So this is a single node. We have uh, one node, four cores on this node. This is today, and this is a week from now. And these are where things could run. So let's see some running jobs on here in this visualization. We see that uh, on core one, there's a job running. It's going to be available in a small fraction of the day. Core two will be available towards the end of the day or the next day. And then core three, and so on. So let's see how a scheduler works in practice. Let's have a number of jobs here. Here we have six jobs. And let's order them in terms of priority. So that's the highest priority job, one, two, three, four, five, six. And let's see how a scheduler actually works. So it submits a job. It tries to run the highest priority job in the first place it can find it. So this job can only start about day uh, three and a half, three and a half days from now because that's when there's enough resources that are available for it. The second highest priority job, look at that. It could start on core one in just a fraction of a day. So even though the second highest priority job isn't the highest priority job, just because the highest priority job cannot fit there, a lower priority job can run before a higher priority job. It won't run if... Uh, it would block the higher priority job from starting as fast as possible. But if it doesn't block higher priority jobs, it will run. So let's run the third highest priority job, as we see, the fourth, and the fifth. So this is how the scheduler would schedule these six jobs. Um, so there's a question about uh, how priority is established. Uh, priority will actually be discussed in the talk on Friday. Uh, it's somewhat complex. Uh, there's simple, well, there's multiple components of it. Uh, full discussion would take a while. Uh, there's, you know, yeah. So we'll take that priority as a given right now. Um, now, this is really interesting what happens. Uh, this is the cluster as the jobs were running, right? So these jobs in blue were promised to be running at least, or to be given these resources until such a date. Uh, oh yeah, well, there's, there's a sixth one. But what happens if a job finishes early? Let's say this job on four, core four crashed. Well, the schedule is, keeps running. So jobs are rescheduled. The highest priority job is scheduled first. The second highest priority job is scheduled. Notice that right now it's been rescheduled to, to run much, much later. Because the, the second highest priority job cannot stop the highest priority job from uh, running. So jobs must be scheduled in order of priority. So notice that as things change in the cluster, when your job runs will actually change, even though your priority hasn't changed in this case. The third highest priority job now moves up quicker. The fourth and the fifth. So everything is rearranged. And this process happens every few minutes in a cluster. Uh, most of the changes aren't so large because mostly clusters have more than one node. Uh, but as we see here, the smaller the cluster, the more inefficiencies and uh, changes happen in it, in it. So in this case, a one-node cluster 
uh, can have uh, large changes happen. There's the sixth job. So um, let's go back to our original example. Uh, this is the one before the, the job of finishing early. In this example, we notice that there's gaps. In these gaps, there's going to be nothing running. These gaps happen because there is no small jobs capable of running in this. So show, backfill. So show BF command tells you how many processes are available for immediate use by anyone, no matter what their priority and for how long. This allows you to tailor your jobs to fit perfectly into the gaps left behind by the scheduler. So if your jobs can be elastic, if you can you know, have them be short or use one or multiple processors, depending upon the size of the gap, you can create your job to fit into one of these gaps, which is available on the, on the cluster, and your job will run immediately. It doesn't matter what priority is, you will get access. And you could use the show BF command to do this. Uh, another good tip is short serial jobs. So if you have a serial means one core. If you need a single core job and you're fine with running for half an hour or two hours, these are quite short jobs compared to the other jobs in the cluster. This type of job will fit into these holes. Doesn't matter what your priority is, you can run. This is the advantage of short serial jobs. If you can make your jobs short and serial, you will get more runtime, basically, because your jobs will fit into the gaps. So there's a few myths. Actually, uh, are there any questions right now? Uh, you could unmute yourself and uh, ask. OK, so there's a question. If everything is being used in the core, is it possible to know when there will be space to run a job? Um, so usually when you run a job, is you ask the scheduler to somehow fit you in into the future, right? That's the usual process of running. And usually there's more than uh, what's it called? Usually, you have many nodes in a cluster, right? So there's usually a few empty spots right now. Um, you can run the show BF command. And right now, it says that on our workshop cluster, we can have 10 nodes and 120 cores are available. So for those of you that don't know what a core is, it's basically a processor. Uh, and the node is a server, a compute server. So here it says that we have 120 processors or cores available for tasks and on 10 different nodes. Uh, so yes, it's possible to break. If it's possible to break up uh, jobs into smaller pieces, it will help. Yes, uh, just don't make the pieces too small, because it takes uh, our schedulers are only able to schedule are run every couple minutes, and they can only start five jobs. So if you break it up into you know 20 second blocks, that's uh, too small. Uh, on Jasper, I would break it up into about half an hour blocks at the smallest. On other systems, maybe two hours. But you know, even even six hour long jobs is fine. Um, another question: Is it possible to estimate how long your job will run for? Well, that's more of an empirical thing. You have to run the jobs, get an idea especially if you have a whole, whole bunch, and then use that, uh, use your original test jobs as a, a way of estimating your, your next jobs, what, how long they are. 
and uh, into how many pieces can you break apart them. Uh, sometimes it takes some compute uh, time to actually save your job and to restore from a save. So you may not want to break up everything into too small of a piece. It all depends on your job and you know how difficult it is to break it up into pieces in order to uh, use the system more effectively and efficiently. Uh, one thing to note is that if you do have jobs that would try to run for months, for instance, on certain machines, uh, the longer and larger your job is, the more likely that a server will crash. Right? If you're using 100 servers or 100 nodes for two months, there is a possibility, quite good, that one of those servers will crash. Your job will die and uh, you'll lose all your work unless you've been saving it. So there are detriments to having uh, very long jobs as well. It's all based upon uh, what your job does and what the cluster, how, how the cluster acts. So let's get into uh, yeah, a few minutes. Um, if there is a large number of jobs in the queue, my job will not run quickly. So that's a myth. That's a really big myth. So most of the time, the jobs belong to users with a very low priority because they're running a large number of jobs. So there's people with no priority, no usage, but they're smart enough to run short zero jobs. And they could have thousands of jobs in the queue. But because they're running so long, uh, their priority will be low according to the uh, fair share system. So your jobs will get priority over theirs, but they will scoop up any remaining crumbs left, you know, any remaining empty uh, processors uh, that are not used by other people. So just because there's a whole bunch of jobs in the queue doesn't mean anything about when your job will run. That's not how it's determined. Another thing is that a lot of these jobs that are in the queue may not be capable of running as the number of running jobs per user may be limited. So there may be limits to how many jobs per individual user could be run at the same time. Uh, so other users can get the chance to run. Right? There could be many other limits in there. And we'll discuss these in our third talk on Friday. Uh, the cluster may even have empty processes available for immediate use, even a lot of them, because of said limits. So deciding if a cluster is busy by the number of queue jobs does not work. Now, uh, so another big myth is it's better not to submit too many jobs at a time so, uh, so that other users can run. Now, that's not true either. The scheduling system is more efficient if you submit your jobs earlier as long as you don't go over certain usage limits. Um, so there is, a limit, there is a limit to the number of jobs you could submit because of memory and other constraints in the scheduler system itself. But provided you don't submit more than, I think, seven or 10,000 jobs uh, at one time, you'll be fine. Um, if you do need to submit such a large number of jobs, there is a process of doing that. It's called the job array, and we'll discuss it. And also, you're not being unfair, because fairness is ensured by the scheduling system. You're actually being considerate by telling the scheduling system what you would intend to do as far out as possible. It will be more efficient for the other users as well. So are there any questions? OK, can you please? OK, so there's a question. Can you decide your own priority? No. So the scheduling system figures out what your priority is. Oh, if you have multiple jobs. Not really. Uh, you cannot uh, decide priority between your jobs. Um, you, you, as a, a group can, uh, but that's more complicated topic that we'll get back to in the third talk. Um, we'll discuss that. 
Um, so a few questions. Uh, so show BF lists duration. So what is that? So show, show BF tells you how many processes are empty for how long. So if we look back in this case here on this cluster, we notice that this core is empty, but it's only empty for maybe a couple hours. So if this was our cluster and you run a show BF command on it, it would tell you that there is one core empty for the next two hours or whenever this uh, location is for this day. Um, we will discuss how you can see your priority a little bit in this talk and mostly on Friday. Priority and fair share and all that. Um, so uh, Damon, uh, we'll go I into how uh, if you had several jobs and wanted to run one first on Friday. Uh, that's a topic that will require uh, the skills you learn today and tomorrow before we can get there. Okay, so we have a question. How do we best estimate the amount of resources or duration required for my jobs in order to request the appropriate wall time? So you have to basically test it out. Uh, most jobs are serial when you start out with, right? Uh, you generally have to compute and you're going to use a batch scheduling system because you want to run, uh, you want to get more resources from a cluster, right? Um, so you have to figure out how long does it take to run on one core, uh, depending on which type of parallelism you have, uh, see how it scales. So does it, do you get a big benefit by running on multiple cores? And also how long the wall time, how long does your, take, your job take to run? So usually the way it works is you're going to be running many, many jobs of the same type. You have one, you don't know how long it will take. You could ask for a long wall time, a very long wall time or as long as possible. Try running it and experiment and see. Uh, so you'll get charged or it'll be considered in your fair share how long you ask for the wall time. But provided you only do it for your first one and then actually to get a given accurate uh, estimate for your other ones, uh, you should be fine. So that's how you would uh, deal with uh, deciding the appropriate wall time. Is there any other questions? Okay. So let's go on to some tips. First one, make sure your job can run on the resources available in the cluster. So uh, there's clusters with uh, different amounts of memory per core, memory per node, um, and also what resources are, are empty right now. Biggest one, make sure your job can actually run on a cluster that you submitted to. The scheduling system is dumb, and it will let you run, on a, run inside uh, a cluster that uh, Will not be, well, it will allow you to submit a job to a cluster that, that, that does not have the resources for your job to actually run on. So that's the first biggest tip. Uh, the second one is look at the state of the cluster, your account and jobs to get information on uh, how to do this. Oh, a question. How do we know what clusters are there besides Jasper? So you can go to the WestGrid webpage Westgate.ca, there's uh, system resources there. There's multiple clusters uh, available on Westgrid. Uh, there's other ones in Compute Canada. You would have to look up the Compute Canada web pages. Um, and another tip is that if a cluster is totally empty and you're able to run a many jobs, there's often a limit to how many cores for how long you could get. So that's a limit of the number of cores for the number of time. If you run shorter jobs, you could actually grab the entire cluster. If you run long jobs, you'll only be able to run on, uh, on a part of the cluster. So let's go to basic job submission. This is how you're going to be submitting jobs.
Okay, so we have a few questions. Um, yes, uh, you can use other Compute Canada resources other than Westgrid, like SharkNet. Uh, you would have to apply for a SharkNet account in the Compute Canada CCDB. You would apply for a consortia account. You would hit that button, and then you would get access onto uh, SharkNet. Uh, are we charged for time by request by wall time or for how long the, act the job actually runs for? So the answer to that is depends on, on which system. Uh, there is a good reason to do either. So, so some systems charge you for how much you actually use. Other systems actually charge you for how much your job actually runs for. If you ask for to run much longer than you run for, uh, you are cause, causing what's it called uh, problems to the scheduling system, so that could, should be accounted for. So a lot of systems actually charge you or put in, consider the time it takes to run your requested job. Yes. Any other questions? Yeah, somebody unmuted themselves. OK, oh, asking about Jasper. On Jasper, I believe we charge for what the request is, or charge. We, we don't actually charge, but uh, it's what uh, is used. So in, in calculating your priority for your next job is how, how much your current job has been, your, your other jobs have been running. And for that, we keep, we keep an accounting on, on how many resources have been used for how long. And we charge there for how long your, 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 your job is requested. Uh, we'll talk more about this on Friday. Uh, yeah. And in, inside the group chat, you'll see uh, links to how to choose systems and to apply for other uh, West Green Compute Canada resources. As, are there any other questions? Yes. Uh, yeah. So, uh, if you have a program, so somebody a job. If you have a program that you wish to run, you need to figure out the resource requirements for your jobs. These requirements include wall time, which is the maximum length of time that your job can take to run, the number of CPUs, memory, nodes or servers, GPUs that are needed to run your job, and the queues you are submitting to. Uh, the command to submit your job is called QSub. Although QSUP allows you to specify your requirements at the command line, you should put your job requirements into a job script. So usually you would run QSUP and then your job script on PBS. So here's an example of a job script. There's a number of things that are happening here. Usually that's your first line. You're saying that bash is the shell that you're going to be running this in. Then you ask for the resources. In this case, you're asking for what for one processor on one node, or one core on one node. So cores and processors here are the same thing. You're asking for how long the maximum time that your job will run. So this is five hours. Uh, the other thing that you're asking here is to be mailed. You want your uh, what's it called uh, job to be mailed. Uh, when your job aborts, before it starts, and after it ends. So that's A, B. And this will automatically mail you after your job finishes, when it starts, or if it fails. You also need to set your email address, and you may want to name your job to be able to more easily see your job um, in some of its commands. 
Another thing that you need to do is you need to actually CD PBS or work there. So you want to have this line in your job submission script in order for the following command to, to actually run in the same directory that you've submitted your job from. So this, will, this is fairly important and you should have that. And in this sample here, we just have the computer sleep for a thousand seconds. But you would replace this with a line running your code, right? So basically here is the same thing again, right? Uh, other ways you could request this proxy equals one, which is the same thing as one node with one processor per node. It means the same thing in this case. Are there qu any questions? Okay. We could go on to interactive jobs. Uh, so one can ask for inter one can ask for an interactive job to run a program on a cluster and interact with it. So basically, these are useful for debugging you would add this extra feature at the top of your job. So basically all PBS jobs begin with pound PBS and then something else. So these are the directives that we give to the scheduling system that figures out where your job runs. These must be at the top of your PBS script and there can't be anything in between them because following the lines will be ignored. And in order to make your job interactive, you would add a pound PPS minus I. Um, if you wish to use multiple processors in interactive mode, please contact support at Westgrid as it's easy to, easy to accidentally start processes on node which your job has not been assigned to. The parallel program you run must be able to interact with PBS and Torque scheduling system and run in the correct processors. Uh, another thing that you should look for is inside your job, there is going to be environment variables. So environment variables are available on all machines. You should see it. Uh, you can see with printf command that these are all the environment variables that are set up on our machine here. You could use these environment variables. The Unix system uses it for many things. For instance, it tells me what my login name was, what my home directory is, and so on. P PBS sets a whole bunch of environment variables that you could use in scripts or in your jobs. And these are the specific ones here. This is a list of them. We will be using some of these and looking at them. So we're going to be uh, having a break for practice. So one of those uh, things that you should have gotten is a worksheet. So on submitting uh, jobs. So when you copied over that directory and you should be in that directory, you should see something like this. You should see some uh, starting blocks, and you should also see the answer directory. If you go into the answer directories, there's actually answers for all these questions. So if we open the, the worksheet and we see submit a serial job that has all these features, the actual there is an actual answer for this. Um, you should try to do your own, especially at the beginning, uh, for the next few questions. These are the basic job submissions. Um, but you can follow along by running these things. So in this case, I 
can put them here. And you can submit. your job and you'll see the job. Uh, so here you, you see my job actually started running right now. Here is the answer for the first uh, question actually. Please make sure that you actually change this email with your email so that you will be emailed when your job finishes, starts, and has a problem. Please don't put anybody else's in there because they're going to get spam. And we're going to be going through the serial jobs. Um, I believe for the first five questions. Um, please uh, start this. Um, if you have questions, please ask them right now. Hello? Yes? Hi. Um, I was just wondering, I'm trying to copy the directory. Sorry, I should have asked you earlier, but I had a little trouble with my baby. Um, it doesn't seem to be copying. I don't know if I can show you my Putty screen by sharing it with you. Um, okay. You need to run this command once you logged in. So basically, I, I what see, this command um, you're typing. Can you can you see this on the? No, I can only see you and the other participants. Okay. I've just been following along with the PDF that I got with the course package. Right. Okay, so you're on Jasper? Yes. Okay, I think he, oh yes. Just scroll down. Okay, yes. So basically, you need to run that command. Uh, you need a space after the minus R. Yes. And a dot at the end. So basically, what the command is, no, no, you need a space after the minus, after the minus R. R. Oh. Right, you're saying copy minus R, which is the recursive command. Then you're having the location you're copying from, and then you need the location you're copying to. Oh, absolutely. Right? And, yes, and dot means the current one, the current oh. one. Okay, so dot like right here. Yes. Okay. Um, if you copied and pasted, you might have from the. Uh, if you copied and pasted from the PowerPoint or the PDF, those da dashes might not be minuses. So you actually should probably replace those. It's um, software instead of solware. Yes, and software instead of solware. Oh. You need a space between your. Where you're copying from, and then you're copying to. So then you need space dot. Oh, there we go. Thank you. You are. Okay. Um, in the packet of uh, things that you got. Oh yes, I'll share my screen. Can you see me? Okay. So in a packet of documents, you should have gotten uh, what's it called? Uh, the PDF for the exercises. You should have also gotten a few reference points, PBS scripts showing you a reference to all the PBS commands separately. Scheduler commands showing you how to run some commands to see what's going on inside the scheduler. 
a worksheet that uh, we're going to go through and the set of slides. In addition, all this stuff is in presentation.tar.bz2 here. So inside this location uh, are all the presentations, including the worksheet. So they should have been copied as well if you copied the whole directory. Right. Look at Global Software Workshop. We have that presentation stuff tar, right? That uh, file, uh, it's tarred and bzipped. You could unzip it or bunzip, right? So you would. Uh, Unzip the there, or sorry, bzip too. Uh, oh, yes. If you copied it over into your directory, uh, you could unzip it. I'm a user here, so I can't do it for the for the global one. Uh, the other advantage, actually, sorry, the best way probably, is go to this link. It looks like we may have lost Camille again temporarily. Come back. Oh. No, you're still there. Okay, sorry about that. You want to go to that link. If you follow that link, link. Oh, wait, this is Because it's on a Google Drive, I think you need to um, change the permissions so that anyone with the link can view. Um, it should be there. Uh, there's two of them. Make sure you get, grab the one which says online, not this. And in here, Forget to put it online. Um, Can I be sharing this with? Yeah, Camille, we've just lost your share. You'll have to retoggle that uh, the share, please. These are all requesting access to it. Which one? I think they might be going for the wrong one. Um, Scheduling through 15 and the folder called scheduling 15. Are there two folders? Yeah. Your spring one. Yes, there's one for your spring session. 
And then there's also one, and it's a spring, and then there's one that is just scheduling 2015, and that's for this one, I believe. I believe I forgot to put it up. Okay. Sorry, okay. You should be able to have access to it now from this location. It's also available in that directory that we were at. Hey Camille, if you're uh, if you're sharing content right now, uh, it dropped when uh, you got cut off there, so we're we're just not seeing it right now. If you could reshare. Okay. So you should be able to see it here. Um. If you have a problem and you click on that link, you should go to workshop scheduling and then all this stuff should be there, including the uh, worksheet. Okay. This worksheet is actually for what's it called, all three days. So for all three workshops. Uh, and you could, of course, untar the presentation.tar.bc too. It's there as well. Um, if you're having an issue with presentations, then you've clicked on on the wrong uh, one. You need to click on this one here, the first one. Uh, there is another one we did that was uh, not an online workshop. That was a workshop we did in the spring for the University of Alberta. Oh, there. Somebody actually posted a link that you should be able to get through just by clicking, double clicking in the group chat. Okay. Can everybody get to it? So in here, our first example, we're going to do a basic example of how to, well, it's work through how to submit a basic jobs. Um, if you are having issues, you can peek at the answer. Uh, here is actually the one for uh, the first question. Uh, that's the answer. Um, that's how its answer can look like. Uh, it includes, you know, emailing the person and so on, right? Uh, and we're going to go through the first five uh, parts right now. So interesting things, when you're running the jobs, you could run Qstep minus A, which will show you, uh, are there any jobs on the system? Show Q. So we're going to start with simple jobs right now, and they're going to get more complex uh, later today and then uh, tomorrow and Friday. So if you're having any questions, please uh, either speak up or send us something to the group chat.
unfortunately, we may not actually have enough time to actually go through or ha have enough time for everybody to write uh, all the questions and answers uh, that we have. These exercises, though, will be available for you later for the next few days. And you could still run these on a regular cluster yourself. So uh, you could run this on the Jasper cluster. The big advantage of having a workshop cluster is that uh, we have a number of nodes. Jobs can run immediately as opposed to waiting. And we'll see what's happening. Do we have anybody else? Has anybody actually uh, was anybody actually able to run a job yet? Even one of the answers that we have, because I don't see any, just my own right now on the cluster. I have a few users logged in, but no jobs yet. So Damon's asking, uh, do we need to create our own PBS script? Yes. So this exercise is involved in creating your own PBS script. You can follow along just by running the ones that are answered, uh, but you should try at least the first few yourself. It's very simple. The first question is asking us to run one core job that emails you when, when it starts, ends, and aborts. Yes. So yes, you can start from scratch. Uh, well, the rough template would be the example that we have. Oops. Uh, so here, here's a rough template. It does actually what most of uh, the, the questions asks you in question one. Um, yeah. I mean, if you want, you could you know get the answer from the answer uh, directory for the first question, go on to the second one, and so on, and just edit it. Um, it's better if you able to create one yourself. Number of users adding yeah, jobs. So as we can see here, when you run a job, you get a job ID. This is your ID for your job. You also have a job name. And when you run the command like qstat minus a, you can see whether the job is running or not. There's a lot more information here. We'll go through this later. All these job scripts have been tested on this system and they work. And the idea here is that when you're running, you can
from that. That will show only your jobs. So on a regular system, large system, there may be you know thousands of other jobs on a system. You're only interested in your own. You could actually refer to dollar sign user, which is an environment variable, which basically all it says is uh, my name. So in this case, you can do that. But you could do the same thing for somebody else. So we can see some jobs running. Some people are running the answer queue on the PBS. Uh, yes, some people call their job uh, differently. And we can see some jobs are finished for the first one, some jobs are running, some jobs are exciting. Are there any questions? If you're running the answer dash q one dot pbs, um, there is your email isn't there, so you're not going to get an email. You need to edit that those uh, scripts to put in your own email in order to get the email back. That's going to be important uh, if you ever need the output of an email about your job, because there'll be some information about your job when it finishes there. Um, so we have a question, is my job running properly? Yeah, it looks like it. Uh, we could see that you requested to, for it to run for five hours, and it's run for one minute, 51 seconds so far. Um, we could look at other stuff. Uh, We'll look at some of these commands uh, later. But we could see running information on your job, including where it's being run. And including what its priority was. So uh, in this exercise, we're asking to run Q step minus A show Q minus U, which is just for yourself, and job info minus J. Uh, those are pretty much the same thing. It seems the email, seems the email is getting rejected as receiving it. Attending uh, is not getting it. Oh. doesn't like you. Okay. Yes. Oh, the question is, where would you put uh, the hostname command in a PBS script? You would put it in around the same time you sleep, either before or after the sleep. Uh, that, that would just tell you wh which host so the hostname command just tells you which host you're on. 
and if it's inside your job, then it'll tell you which job, uh, which host it was run on. The other part to notice, it's interesting, is you should be getting these files right here. So you see .o and then the job ID and .error in the job ID. If you actually look at them, you'll see that that's the actual output in your host name. And you'll see that this is your error and there's nothing in there. Oh, so the question, why do we need sleep time? So the reason I asked you guys to put sleep in there is because otherwise the job would Im finish immediately and then you couldn't see a running job, right? If you run the QSTEP minus A, as we can see here that there's running jobs right now. So we have a couple users running jobs. If we didn't have a sleep time and the only command you run was hostname, that command takes a very small fraction of a second to run and we wouldn't see anyone in the jobs. We're asking, what's a PBS document? Well, it's a file, right? So usually, uh, so usually we have a PBS script that runs. So it's usually a script that ends with .pbs. In this case, our answer, right? PBS, that's a PBS script, PBS document. Uh, and in that one, you should have changed at least the email that gets uh, sent to which location. Yeah, it's like the .sa script. Uh, I've also told by uh, somebody that we should actually use bin bash instead of bin sh uh, in our scripts, preferably. Uh, more things will work. No, it, it, it works. They were actually referring to our other workshop. Are there any other questions? Okay, so how many queues are there on a cluster and how to list them? Um, so Q stack minus A will show you all the queues, all the queued jobs in the cluster. Uh, sometimes clusters have specific queues. Um, and then you could see which jobs are uh, in there. Uh, basically, you just want to do a queue sub. You, you usually don't submit to a specific queue. Uh, I'm not sure uh, how to list all the queues on a cluster. Uh, usually you just submit and then have the scheduling system put you into the queue, correct queue and take the correct actions.
Um, so we have another question. Is there a way to see a queue from a particular node? I submit our cluster with both GPU and CPU nodes. So usually you should submit your jobs on the logged node, right? The machine that you logged in on. That's where usually you submit your jobs. And then the scheduling system will figure out how to run on both GPU or nodes with CPUs and nodes with CPUs and GPUs. And we'll talk about how to submit jobs that use both. So let's go through our examples. I know not everybody has uh, actually done it, but uh, we want to actually uh, finish it. Um, somebody's saying is it weird that my job is still running, had no sleep time by accident. Sometimes it takes uh, a respond. Sometimes it may take a second or two for the scheduling system to uh, change its state. Run it. It's that minus A minus C. Show my jobs. I'll show you my jobs there. This is another way to see them. and job info minus j in command. Uh, all these are different ways of seeing jobs from. You should have also got email the result. And you should see all these uh, outputs created. And if we actually display them, it should actually note which node your job ran on. Oh, the question is, why multiple outputs? So if you run the same script multiple times, you'll get multiple outputs. Uh, usually, the, one of the outputs will be a .o file with a job name. Right? So if you look at the, this was the script, the q1.pbs, we have a .o file for an output. That's a standard output. And we have the job ID. Uh, we also have a .e file, which is the error. So if there's any errors, or anything sent to standard error, then you'll see something in there. So for the first uh, one, for the first answer to the first question, you're not going to get anything there. Um, you guys should note that in with the worksheet here, we have a clean command which should clean up all, all the outputs uh, if you're having too many of them. I also put in a run info, which actually runs some of these commands. So run the show q minus u user, uh, q step minus a user, and job info minus j. Uh, just so we can get an output quickly. Let's look at the second job. The second one, what we're asking to is to have a maximum wall time of two minutes and runs uh, the command host name. So. And it runs a non-existent uh, command called uh, hello. So see, it tries to run hello. Now, uh, what you should notice when you run this uh, command after it finishes, it should give you an error because there is no command called hello.
you're taking another minute to run. But it will develop, it will give you a return values and it will return an answer. It, it's return, it will have an error. So we'll look at that one later. You should also, for the question two, it will also email you one. Question three is quite similar. In here, we're setting a wall time of uh, two minutes and we're trying to sleep for 200 seconds. You might have noticed that 200 seconds is longer than two minutes, which is 120 seconds. Uh, so basically, this is what happens if you don't ask for long enough full time. Okay. We'll get back to question two and three. They run. And question four, uh, we just decided to name this job my fourth job. This is a way of naming a job. So when you look at the job IDs, you, you, you not only have to follow the job by the job ID, but you could actually give it a specific name that isn't your uh, PBS script. So this may be useful for organizational purposes. Uh, so on the fourth job, we see that it's named my fourth job. Any questions? Okay. So somebody's saying, I didn't receive any emails. Did you actually go in to these uh, jobs and actually put in your email address? If you have edited this with your email address, uh, you should be getting them. Maybe it's taking for the email system a while to send your emails. Okay, so for question two, so we could see we have an output of a host name output. We also have an error file and it says, hello, not found. So this is what you should get. This is why this error is there. And yes, so those three lines we've changed the above email. So that's an email address that just goes nowhere. And that's just meant to remind you to change that. Uh, previously, I had put my name in in there for all these uh, answers, but then I ended up getting email when everybody's jobs were running. So, and we see my third one has finished. There's no output and a regular output. And we see in the error file that PBS job was killed because after 164 seconds, which is longer than the limit, which was done for 120. So this is what happens when your job gets killed uh, because it runs longer than its wall time.
So for sex, uh, section five, that's an interesting one. We see that this is your first interactive job. And you notice that what happened right here. The job started, the job is running, and now where I previously was on node 230, I'm on node 229. So this is inside my running job. So this is the environment that your job sees. In this case, instead of running the commands that you have and finishing, it's letting you do things. That's what an interactive job means. So at this point, we could start going through. Uh, we could do a printf grep minus i pbs. This shows all these pbs commands. So we could see very many things, what we're logged in as, which queue we're a part of, and so on, our directory. So what's my job name? Well, actually, you should just go. Uh, you, you, you could get that from looking at this variable, right? So you could just do a printf and then grab for PBS. Or you can directly just you know, run the echo uh, PBS job name. And it will actually return to you with your job name. So the question was, what's my job's ID? Well, that's an environment variable called PBS job ID, and it tells you the job ID. Uh, you can also see which directory you're in. So here is a cool thing. If you do a PWD, that's present and working directory, and it tells you that you're in home Camel. Now, home Camel is not where we were before we submitted the job. That's just the regular directory. Uh, if you notice that there's a, something called PPSO work there, that's the directory that we submitted the job from. We most likely want to go back there. So this command in your job, whether it's an interactive or not, should usually be there, the first command, because we want to go to there. So now we're from the same directory that we submitted the job. Otherwise, you'll see that your environment has changed. Uh, another thing that you can see is your path. So this is on a different machine, and you can see that this, jaw, th th this is your path. So this is all the locations of all the binaries that all your commands are. So what path is, is if you, for instance, type the ls command, well, somewhere your ls command is usually is located in bin ls, and bin is in your path. Somewhere in here, it says user bin or bin uh, in your path. So that's directories where all your running stuff is from. So uh, for advanced Unix users, so this is optional, but um, if you want to know how the system works, uh, there is a CPU set that's created to stop you from stomping onto other people's jobs. So if you ask for a part of the machine, in order for you not to affect other people, you're running inside a CPU set. So your job ID right here, right? I did the LS job ID. If we echo the job ID, this is your job ID. Then we see that that's CPU set that defines which, uh, which C on which CPUs, which memory piece does this job run on. So if you try to use too much resources, they'll stop you. Uh, so one thing that you can do is you can echo your current shell. So that's how you echo your current shell. That's the task ID. That's the number of the process that Bash is running, right? So the one that you're interacting with in your shell, where you're typing ls and so on. 
and that's process ID on this machine is uh, 10402. You could actually list all the processes ID in this uh, CPU set and see that your shell is along the. So this is what keeps you from breaking out on this machine and uh, damage uh, and using resources for other people's jobs. So this is a, a, more of an advanced Unix thing, but uh, this is how the uh, scheduler interacts with it. So we could even get an ID for the CPUs. So I am running right now on CPU zero and running on uh, what's it called? Mem memory socket zero and one. So this prevents me from uh, using CPUs outside the, of this. So not, not to stop on somebody else's job. Uh, so the current uh, job only uses one process, but for, for future comparison, we probably want to see a few other things. We could see this is a this is a file uh, so pbs node file is a pbs node file is a environment variable it points to a file and inside this file it lists what's it called the pro it lists each node name for each process that your job is running for so if you're asking for two processors on a single node, it would not list nodes twice. So how many nodes we're running on? Well, obviously, we're only running on one. Number of processors is also one. But this will change for more complex jobs. How many processors per node? Just one. And if we echo for an array ID, we, there is none. So that environment variable doesn't exist. Yeah, and now if you go to your other sessions, remember I asked you to open two sessions. You could do a Q step minus A and notice that that session is still running for the last six minutes. Of me and other people's as well. Right, and we asked for 20 minutes. And so six minutes and 20 minutes there. So you could get out of here in two different ways. You could type the exit command after you're, you, you've run this stuff, or you could uh, hit the control key and press D. So either an exit or a control D. And notice that once your job finishes, your interactive session is over, and you're back in the regular queue. So this is how you would experiment and do tests, right? Um, if you want, if you weren't sure how how to get your job running, you're having issues. You could make it interactive, and go through the steps yourself. Okay. Any questions? If there is no questions, we'll continue on. So parallelism. Basically, we're going to be running more complex jobs right now, jobs that use more than one core. So there's multiple types of parallelism, right? One, one opportunity for parallelism is instead of running one serial job, you just run many serial jobs. So that's a great way of parallelizing stuff. If your tasks can be broken up into many jobs, and each of them run independently, that's a very, very efficient. Another one is for your jobs to your, your, your job to run on many processes, each of which uh, coordinate with each other by passing messages. This means that they could run on many uh, different nodes, or 
you could want to use multiple cores on a single node or a single server. Or you could use a hybrid or advanced system where you could use multiple processors on multiple machines. So let's see what's going on. Let's visualize a multi-node cluster. So notice that previously we had a one core cluster. That was node one. Well, now we have a three node cluster. So many serial jobs. If we have multiple serial jobs, serial job one, two, three, four, this is how we would uh, run them. So many serial jobs use one CPU per job. They're the easiest and most efficient to schedule. The excellent scaling and linear speed up. An example of this is uh, parameter searches. Your PBS file, one would ask for a serial job on the following ways. So this is what we've been doing. Either prox equals one or nodes equals one, processes per node equals one. And just do it multiple times. So this is an example from previously. So tips for running more serial jobs. It's a bit shorter serial jobs. So you could fill in those holes. Many shorter serial jobs will run before a larger job. Checkpoint longer jobs and submit them as shorter serial jobs. So if your code allows you to checkpoint, instead of running for a month, you could you know, checkpoint every 12 hours and run a 12 hour job, uh, hour long job. Uh, you could break up your job into smaller pieces. It will also save you if the cluster suffers a hardware or power failure. So, but sometimes running multiple serial jobs gets tedious. So in this case, you would use a job array. Jobs are, arrays are used when you need to submit a large number of jobs using the same job script. So there's a naming convention for jobs in an array, which is useful if you don't need to remember a large number of unique job IDs or job names, right? So it would be job name and then open square bracket, some number, closed square bracket. And that number in there is your array ID. Uh, job arrays are preferred as they don't require as much computation by the scheduling system to schedule as they are evaluated as a group instead of each individually because they're the same size. So you can ask for a job array in one of the following ways, usually with a minus T. You could ask for a range, say from the number 0 to 99. So that'll give you a job array of 100 jobs numbered 0 to 99. You could specify the numbers yourself, 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, for instance. And then the job array IDs will be 1, 2, 3, 5, 7. So number 4 and number 6 will not be there. You could also tell the scheduling system that you would want to run 100 jobs, but you only want to run 5 at the same time. You would do that with the percent sign here. Uh, in order to display information about a, a job array, you may need to use double quote. And in order to see Q stat, Q stat minus A won't handle it. You need to do a Q stat minus T. And that will show you all your job stuff in a job array. So here is an example job array script. Notice it has the T here. And in here, we just output some environment variables. So as we previously looked at some of these environment variables before. Uh, in this case, it will just print them out into your output. Uh, so that's an example there. An MPI job. So an MPI job is a type of parallel job. In this case, it's a message passing. It, notice that it can run, you use cores on different machines or multiple cores on the same machine. And each of these uh, processes on each of these cores communicates by sending messages over the network or internally on this node. Notice that the whole job has to start at the same time. So enough resources for the whole API job have to be available. It can't start staggered like many serial jobs are. So as a result, MPI jobs you know, cost some a little bit of waste, and they're not they don't run quite as fast as many serial jobs. So, oops, so that sorry, they cost some waste and don't run as fast as many serial jobs. So MPI jobs use network for path message passing. Each job uses multiple CPUs, of which can be on a different node. Each process is, uses a different memory address space, 
and they're more difficult to write than OpenMP as dead blocks are common. So it's possible that one of your cores is waiting for another one to talk, and that other one is also waiting for the first one, and they're confused. So it's much harder to write code, which makes sure that the situation never happens. Uh, but they could scale better than some of the alternatives. So you could do MPI job submission with prox minus L prox equals 64. This will run on 64 processors. So a third type of parallel job is a single node multi-core job. So this is tends to be used in OpenMP or threaded programs, uh, as well as Gaussian. So jobs that use the Gaussian uh, command program are like this. So all the threads must run on a single node. The threads share the memory, address space. You could compile serial and parallel executables from the same code. And it's one of the easiest methods of parallelizing because you could do it incrementally uh, if you're programming. So OpenMP job submissions. Uh, this type of job must have its memory thread running on one node, sharing the same memory. Communication between parts of the job is done via the memory, and you ask for a job in this format. Nodes equals one, processes per node equals eight. In this case, you're asking for eight cores on one node. Uh, of course, there has to be a node with eight cores for this to run. One can ask the program to run a number of threads via environment variable. So when it starts inside your jobs, it sets open empty num threads to eight. That's the scheduler sets this environment variable up. And when open MP starts, it actually reads this environment variable and then runs across eight cores. Um, so it's usually set uh, this way from the PBS num PBS or num and p. Tips for running OpenMP jobs. Check that the state of cluster to see if your job will run quickly. If you need a larger job, use Breezy or the Hungary cluster on West Grid. Uh, if you have a number of OpenMP style jobs, you should consider running longer jobs using less cores or less CPUs per job instead. So it may be faster to actually run longer using less cores or not, right? But that advice may not apply to you if you're using a large amount of resources like RAM per job. Are there any questions? Okay. Wow, okay. Hybrid jobs. So, a hybrid job, you could use multiple nodes with a certain number of uh, processes per node. In this case, you have nodes two, processes per node equals two. Notice that they all have to start at the same time, and you have a block of nodes. So why, why would you use it? Well, it's possible to combine OpenMP and MPI to run on a cluster of SMP machines, or even just a regular cluster right now. You may need more memory or other resource than is available per core. And there's advanced systems of running parallel jobs, which can utilize resources more effectively. So communication between cores is faster than communication between distant nodes or servers. Now, these systems for parallel programming include the Chapel languages as well as partition global address space languages, PCAS, such as Unified Parallel C, Core A, Fortran. So either you use OpenMP slash MPI and an MPI program together, or one of these more advanced languages. Uh, or program written in one of these more advanced languages to run. And here's a description of how all of these are done in a nice table. Um, so are there any questions? Um, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, um, I wanted to ask you about what's the difference between running a job array or just submitting a lot of SNIT jobs where the names are different just in terms of scheduling? With the job array, would those get done for faster? 
Uh, right, right now I've just been submitting a lot of jobs. I have different names. I haven't made use of job arrays. Right. So the advantage of job arrays are twofold, right? One, it allows you to submit w one job, which is identical, right? Because the job array jobs have to be identical. The only difference is the array ID, right? Yes. So if you have a whole bunch of identical jobs, but you're getting different job names, it may be confusing for you on how to handle that, right? You're, yes. you're having different job names. This way, you have you, 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 your job. You have the regular job name and an array ID, right? It's easier yeah. to understand what's going on. It's also better from the scheduler points of view, because the scheduler doesn't have to consider each of your jobs as an individual job of different types. It could yeah. just say uh, it's a job of that type, right? So if you have yeah. a thousand jobs, each of the same size, it it doesn't have to consider all thousand of your jobs whether they can actually run next. It knows that if one of your jobs in a job array won't run, won't fit into a into a location, then none of yours will. Okay, but it doesn't actually cause my work to be done sooner if I submit it as an array rather than. No. Um, mod okay. Okay. No. Thank you. It's, it's just nice for from your perspective and from the scheduler's perspective as well. Okay. Right? Okay. Thanks for explaining. And other people, uh, when they do a Q step minus a aren't going to see 10,000 jobs from you. They may just see one job array. So it will be easier uh, when you do a Q stat. Thanks. OK. So uh, we can uh, break for practice. So we have. Uh, Number of questions we could go on to in our worksheet. So, uh, number six, seven, eight, nine are all job arrays, and ten actually as well. Um, then we go through MPI, OpenMP, hybrid jobs. So all the way up to question sixteen, we could go through. Uh, we may not have enough time to go through everything within the allotted time period today. Um, I will be around for helping users uh, and you guys uh, going forwards. Uh, we can demonstrate some of this stuff. Um, if there isn't enough time, you can actually look at the answers answer key as well. Are there any questions? So we can see here, if you do a Q step minus A, you only see that the fact that there's a job array. If you do a minus A minus T, it will actually show you all the parts of the job array.
And as you can see, when you run these job arrays, you'll get output one for each job in the job array. So unfortunately, to go through these, I will be going through these. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to actually work through all the examples. Um, job info minus J. So any of these commands um, show Q, Q step minus A, show you a different uh, output. This is the Q step minus T minus user. We'll show you your job array. So for question eight, if you run that, you can actually add, give it different indexes. As you can see, here are the jobs. Here are the indices 1, 2, 7, and 13. Notice that the 13 becomes positive. You can't give it a negative index for an array. So interactive job arrays. It actually doesn't let you do it. So you can't actually submit an interactive job array because it doesn't make sense, right? You're asking for an array of jobs. It won't work. So you can skip question nine. Um, you could submit a job that actually, job array that actually prints out these. You'll see that inside. For question. Oh, okay, so question about uh, somebody who has run job arrays and what would be beneficial to run an MPI job. So yes, an MPI job is when you want to have one simulation and it's written to use MPI and you want it to say run on a thousand cores across a cluster. So when you can't break up your job into pieces, when it's one thing, right? So w one potentially large uh, example would be if you want to do a climate simulation. That may be an MPI job. You're trying to simulate the whole climate across the world. You need to divide the whole world into smaller pieces, have a simulation run or a chunk of the world uh, on a few cores and so on. Yeah, so something huge or something bigger, right? So it doesn't have to take, you know, 100,000 cores. It could just take, you know, 15 or 100. But when you have one job, one simulation, and you want to divide it up into pieces. So uh, yes, and of course, you need a program written in API. So somebody has to write the program and have it understand how to paralyze it via uh, sending messages. So uh, looking at question 10. So question 10 is useful. Uh, sometimes people don't like having um, such a big mess. They would like to run uh, a job array, but have a whole bunch of inputs inside a single file. So we could look at this uh, single file. It has uh, two, set, two columns of numbers. And question 10 basically basically is an example of how you would run an array job, get an array ID, then based upon your array ID, Grab the so if your array is one, 
you'd grab the first line if your array ID is four, you would grab the fourth line and then use those numbers in that line to input into some equation. In this case, we're just doing a little bit of, uh, we're multiplying the, the first number by two and adding the second one, and then we could output it. So this is an example of how you could organize uh, running a job array from a single input file. In, in this case, it'll, it'll write to a whole bunch of output files, but similarly, you can uh, output it just to one file if you organize it, uh, something like this. And in, in this example here, we have an array idea of one, and that first line of numbers is uh, one and 11. The first number is one, 11, and then we just, you know, do some math on it. And so on. So this is an example of uh, how, if you have simple inputs and you have a very large number of uh, and you want to feed it into a large job array, this is how you could do it, especially if you have more than one input per line. For an MPI job, that's question 11. Here's an example of an actual running uh, MPI job. Uh, it's the one that you start off with. Uh, I believe there is a start MPI. In this case, you start off with one processor and you run. And then you could run with four processors. And you could see the difference in how long it takes for a runtime. So that's an example of running an MPI job in question 11. And yeah, so you could learn more about the job. You could see that it's all four of the cores are running on the same node. Question 12, we do an interactive job. And once again, we go on to another node. So inside this, actually, I've set it up to give us the answers. Uh, but uh, our PBS job ID is 1775. And, oh, so okay. and critique each other's proposals. And Excuse I would me? expect that there would be a minimum of five comments per page. Someone needs to mute their mic, please. Notes. We're hearing the audio from the field. Yes. 30 or 40 comments per page. <laughs> a lot more than that. <laughs> in some cases. 
So, um, and then, so the idea is to critique each other's proposals, make at least five comments per page, and then hand them back. And then next week, when I'm not here, find a different. Okay, that's much better. Um, so if you actually run the, what's it called, answer-q12.pbs, it'll actually uh, give you the answers to all what's hidden in uh, the interactive jobs. But as, as you can see, the environment variables show uh, your job ID, uh, the, the number of nodes, how many processes per node that it's running for. Uh, then it will also give you the list of node names where each process is run. So in this case, they're all four. Can you see? Okay. So we're still inside what's it called? Uh, the MPI job. We could see that there is no array ID because we're not running an array job. Although it may be possible to run an array of MPI jobs or something like that. We could look at the CPU set if you're interested. Uh, making sure that uh, you could look at our current shell, it's 14.381, and it is in, it is in, a, in a set of uh, processes that is inside the CPU set. So for this job, we see that it's using CPU 0 through 3 on memory location 0 and 1 on this server. Um, if we look at another machine, if we look at, uh, at our other session, You can see we're running our interactive job. And then it has a number of tasks equals four. Uh, that means basically four processes here. my jobs this running as soon as we end this one control D we can see that it is complete so we can run the point 13 uh, it's pretty much the same thing uh, Notice that you can actually be running on multiple uh, machines. I think we'll skip question 13 uh, and continue on to question 14. So question 14 is running an OpenMP job. And if there is any questions, please, please ask. Question 14 um, asks us to run an interactive job, so we're in there again. And in thing. In question 14, we can actually go through all this stuff. So notice we have our job ID again. Num nodes is one, so we're only running on one node, but 12 processes per node. And lists of the nodes where our processes are at. Notice that they're all on the same node. So that's the important parts of uh, 14.
So uh, in this example, notice that we have uh, nodes equals four, processes per node equals four. So we're asking for four nodes with four processors each. If we run all our commands, just first the show Q minus U user, it shows you we're running on 16 processors. If you do a Q stat minus A, it shows you that we're running on four nodes with 16 tasks. So this shows you how many cores you're running and how many, many servers you're running on. Drop it for minus J just shows you 16 cores. You can run the check job command to give you more information about the job. It shows you that it's allocated the job onto four different nodes. So running this interactive job for number 16, we can see that uh, PBS node, num nodes is two, so we're running on two nodes uh, with 10 processors all together with five processors per node. When we look at our list of CPUs on which uh, parts of this job are running, nodes 229 and 228, when we look at the CPU set on our current node, we can see that uh, there are four cores. Uh, if we logged into the other node, if the SSH to node CL2228, we'd also run this uh, command. We'd also see uh, four cores being used. There are five cores being used. Sorry. Five on each. For question 16. Um, so this is our, uh, I guess, end of the uh, Hi, worksheet for the first class. Uh, in the second class, we're going to be covering how do you wor work with memory. Um, so basically how to figure out how to ask for enough memory for your job and how to deal with uh, all those questions. Uh, we're also going to be going over uh, other types of resources, how do you ask for GPUs and so on, and how to look at what's going on inside a cluster. On the third course, we're going to be talking about priority, fair share, uh, how come you got that job, or why does your job crash, or it's, what, why is your job not running? Um, so we'll be talking about those things in the next two sessions. Uh, you are free, of course, to use this cluster right now. This is a test cluster. It will be available over the next few days. Uh, you'll be able to run jobs immediately on this one as opposed to Jasper, where you'd have to wait for your jobs to run. Because users would actually be uh, using it for real jobs. Um, you can go through these examples uh, at your leisure. Um, are there any questions?
Um, so if anybody has uh, any questions beyond this course, uh, please send an email to support us. Good.